course, thank you to Paul for uh, inviting me to contribute to uh, to this, and it, and it just was, you know, when, when he asked me if I, I was interested, I just seemed like a wonderful opportunity to do something um, that was not in the typical academic mode, uh, something a bit different, and as and I did warn you, right, that I would be a bit contrarian about this um, and give uh, almost a kind of op opposite point of view in some ways. Um, and uh, so uh, as part of it, the title of, of my essay is The Touching Interface of the Cosmos, uh, or I mean, I'm mocking you. <laughs> um, but uh, what I'll read uh, is uh, some excerpts from, from the essay. Um, what is it about the sky above that moves us so? We, we know that our ancestors looked up at the sky and saw a firmament full of life, of birds and bats and bugs that fly, and also something more, celestial beings, supernatural entities recognizable as the sun and moon, the stars and planets, comets and meteors and all that. And what sets the heavens apart from our earthly en environment beyond their distance is that the sky plays host to these innumerable entities whose movements are steady and predictable in, in ways that far exceed anything we encounter on land or sea. The sun, the moon, the stars and planets follow a pattern that uh, until just recently could only be seen as pure perfection, a rhythm characterized by a regularity far beyond that of the seasons, the ebb and flow of the tides, and the periodic flooding of rivers like the Nile. So they are their, our first and truest experience of a, of a truly objective sense of time, time that exists independently of subjective and intersubjective human experience, not to mention the vagaries of nature. Our calendars and our clocks are media that extend our perception of the dance of the heavenly spheres, keeping time by following the rhythm of their observed revolutions measuring time by the meter of their motion. Now for Aristotle and his fellow ancients who are living within a literate culture while maintaining a religious tradition that we come to know as called pagan, the sun, moon, planets, and stars were identified with the gods and other supernatural entities. And in an effort to reconcile Aristotelian science with Jewish theology, the medieval philosopher Moses Maimonides allowed that the heavenly spheres had some form of intelligence and occupied a position uh, of a higher order than humanity but lower than God and the angels. In his Mishnah Torah completed in the 12th century, uh, he stated that God, who's characterized by neither form nor matter, divided creation into three parts. At the bottom of the hierarchy, we have human beings along with animals, plants, minerals, all characterized by the combination of matter and form and subject to continual change. At the top of the hierarchy, immediately below God, are the angels. They have form but not matter and are not subject to change. So in between the two are the planets and stars who are composed of form and matter but fixed and unchanging. But their association with permanence and eternity persisted as the astronomies of Ptolemy gave way to those of Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler. And as the understanding of the universe was transformed from a sacred, sacred ecology to a perfect machine based on the physics of Isaac Newton, otherwise known as the clockwork universe. And consider the fact that the enlightenment metaphor of the clockwork universe is actually a reversal of the original me metaphor. The mechanical clock is a metaphorical simulation of the revolution of the heavenly spheres. And to, to this day, their movement ha has the final uh, say when it comes to answering the question, what time is it? Or as we used to say, what is the time of day? Even though we have atomic clocks that keep time with greater precision than any astronomical phenomenon, 
we still feel compelled to reset our clocks to keep them in sync with the sky. For example, a leap second was added to our coordinated universal time at midnight on June 30th of this year so as not to fall out of sync even in so imperceptible a manner with the Earth's rotation, which of course is slowing as time goes on. So time is our most essential environment, and while time itself is invisible, time's reflection can be observed in its most objective form in the heavens above us. And even if the microcosm of the subatomic may possess a regularity that surpasses the macrocosm of the universe, we can't actually see anything as small as an atom while the planets and stars are visible to the naked eye. Of course, all perception is itself a form of time travel. What registers on our senses are reflections of events that have passed, even if the delay is only momentary. The visual sense being our most distant of receptors, the further away the object of our gaze, the further back in time we're looking. And it's well known that as we extend our eyes through the agency of the telescope and look further and further out into space, we are in fact observing an increasingly more distant past. Whether we will one day be able to view the birth of the universe remains to be seen, no pun intended. <laughs> but within the bounds of the relativity of time, our relation to the cosmos is absolute. That is, we live in cosmic time. Now the atmosphere we've come to extend is our interface to the celestial sphere. And as an interface, the sky is by nature Janus-faced. Its two sides as different from one another, as antonymic as night and day. When we look at the nighttime sky, we look up into mystery, into the deepest of mysteries, while the daytime sky is comfortably familiar. It's a wild blue yonder that, like the wine-dark sea, is contiguous with our terrestrial comfort zone seemingly within reach, if not entirely navigable. Blue sky may not be practical, but it is a product of unbridled optimism. Blue skies are a sign of happiness, as Irving Berlin observed. And while the opposite may be said of storm clouds, we still look for that silver lining. Yes, there's something at least a little bit friendly about the daytime skies, something somehow inviting when the sun is shining bright. The sun lights up our atmosphere, making it opaque and visible. And when it disappears from the horizon, the air becomes transparent and invisible, a window onto outer space. This turns the nighttime sky into something altogether different, alien and foreboding. The welcoming openness of the blue disappears into an oppressively ominous blackness. An unknowable and inhospitable dark punctured innumerably by the pale and distant light of the stars and moon. Still, the mystery of the nighttime sky is an object of fascination as well. The ebbing and flowing of the moon, the complexity of the constellations, the entire array of stars, planets, and other celestial bodies entices us as the source of endless wonder. The daytime sky is finite, bounded, but the nighttime sky gives us a glimpse of infinity and eternity. It is the subject of the most intense form of awe. Now, the contrast between day and night can be summed up in a few simple statements then. The daytime sky is near, the nighttime sky is far. The daytime sky is immediate, the nighttime sky is distant. The daytime sky is imminent, the nighttime sky is transcendent. We're touched, we're moved to touch the sky, to go so far as to kiss the sky, as a spiritual pathway, a ways to rise up through imminence towards transcendence. But I want to note a different sense in which we might think about the Janus faced sky, one that acknowledges the irony that our search for transcendence has only succeeded in making the transcendent recede ever further into the distance, or more aptly placed the eternal return, a connection to the moment of creation, even further out of reach, telescopically in space and in time, 
I want, in other words, to acknowledge my own ambivalence about all this, the conflict between my heart that takes inspiration from our efforts to touch the face of the cosmos, and my head that questions whether we can ever break on through to the other side of the firmament, firmament that lies above us, whether we are, in fact, searching for something that does not exist or that cannot be found out there within the darkest of skies. The daytime sky is familiar. The nighttime sky is alien. The daytime sky is what is known and knowable. The nighttime sky is what is unknown and unknowable. The daytime sky represents illumination and enlightenment. The nighttime sky represents the mysterious and uncanny. The daytime sky is visible. The nighttime sky is invisible, transparent. The daytime sky reflects the air that we breathe, the most basic requirement of, for life. The nighttime sky unveils the vacuum of outer space, an environment utterly hostile to our survival. The sky, then, is the interface that both separates and connects us to something wholly other than us. The atmosphere is the boundary that separates our planet from what lies beyond. We become caught up in the act of touching the interface in an effort to move through it to whatever lies on the other side. But what is it that waits for us out in the void? Could it be nothing at all? The daytime sky is being. The nighttime sky is nothingness. Now, almost a half a century ago, Lewis Mumford injected a note of skepticism in, into what he referred to as our space travail. He was pointed to the parallel that exists between our own efforts to send our astronauts up into what we consider to be the heavens compared to the ancient Egyptians sending their pharaoh and his companions to their version of heaven. Ultimately, Mumford draws the, drew the following conclusion concerning space exploration. And uh, this is actually a fitting rejoinder to Paul. Um, so I'm going to quote from uh, his Myth of Machine. He writes, and this is 1970, by now, this exploration has reached a natural terminus. The last frontier is closed. The landing of the first two astronauts on the moon was not the beginning of a new age of cosmic exploration, but the end. The scientific technological revolution that began in the 16th century therewith reached its appropriately sterile terminus a satellite as uninhabitable as the Earth itself will all too soon become unless by a massive expenditure of imagination and courageous political effort, the peoples of the world challenge the age-old power complex without a counter-movement to slow down or reverse these automatic processes. Mankind comes closer year by year to what is in more than one sense a dead end. A dead end? Perhaps. I cite Mumford not because I'm in total agreement with him, but I credit him with making me question my own assumptions about space travel and from turning me from being a complete enthusiast, a fanboy, if you will, into a divided self, ambivalent and agnostic. So I'm willing to ask the simple question, what for? Or as Neil Postman liked to put it, to what problem is this a solution? Mumford's more specific question would be, given limited resources and such great need here on Earth, why put all of this time, effort, and money into such projects? What are we looking for? If it is transcendence, the problem is that we've yet to achieve the kind of epiphany depicted in Stanley Kubrick's 2001. There's no indication that we ever will. What are we looking for? Some say it's simply a backup plan. Should our planet become uninhabitable, whether due to our own stupidity through, say, global warming or nuclear winter, or due to some other catastrophe, an asteroid colliding with our planet, sun going nova sometime in the future? And there's an ecological edge to this theme in its emphasis in the need to preserve our species and as much of our world's flora and fauna as possible 
Uh, and it's no denying the goodwill behind such motivations, nor is there any denying the certainty that life on Earth will eventually come to an end. Whether it is at all possible to transport our entire biosphere onto some sort of space arc and ultimately transport it, transplant it onto another planet is not at all clear. It may well be that our lives and our species are inescapably bound to spaceship Earth and that there's no escaping our interdependence and the intertwining of our fates. Indeed, an environmentalist slogan being passed around the internet plays on the phrase Plan B, insisting there is no planet B. Granted, all things being equal, there's every reason to pursue the possibility of pioneering our way out into the cosmos, but when we come back to the fact of limited resources, the question remains of whether adventures in outer space would produce the greatest good for the greatest number, of whether our time, money, and energy are better directed at the many needs that exist on the ground today, <coughs> whether any escape from disaster would serve anyone other than the elite who could afford the trip. The abstract idea of the survival of our species may seem a very base and basic reason for traveling beyond the confines of our planet, but it's also, in a sense, another form of wished-for transcendence. It's a kind of denial of death in a collective sense. Even if we leave our home behind, even if we spread out among the stars, will the universe exist forever? Science suggests that it's not eternal, so one way or another, there will be an ending, and all that we have created will vanish without a trace. Now, I want to make it clear that the questions I pose here, the expressions of skepticism that I introduce, go against the grain of my fondest hopes and dreams. They, as I said, they come from my head, contradicting my heart, because I want to live in the future that I believe I was promised as a child, the future of starships flying faster than the speed of light travel to other planets, encounters with intelligent and friendly alien beings. But I have to admit at the same time that I've only seen a small portion of my own world and only interacted with a tiny portion of the over seven billion human beings that inhabit this planet. When we refer to the cosmos, there's a double meaning, almost contradictory in its connotations. In one sense, it refers to cosmological research and the theories of modern science. On the other, it refers to the cosmologies of religious belief systems. Religion, in its best sense, is about the spiritual quest for transcendence. Science, on the other hand, is concerned with knowledge of the imminent and tentative rather than eternal truths. And so, we may look up into the sky with wonder, we may travel to the stars and find inspiration in the deepest recesses of the universe. But in the end, which cosmos are we really looking for? And can either one serve as the pathway to transcendence? Or is the interface all that we can ever experience? A window through which we can look but not touch what lies beyond our reach in the distance and through which we can look at a time that has receded into the past and can never be retrieved, that we can never return to? Is the interface even a transparent membrane through which we can at least gain enlightenment about the universe beyond ourselves? Or is it an insurmountable barrier? Is it a mirror that only shows us an image of ourselves that we may have forgotten? In a cosmos ruled by relativistic, relativistic physics, is there anything that we can see and know and touch that is something other than an interface? <laughs>